Good evening. Welcome to Worship at Grace Lutheran Church as we uh, begin and step into this Advent season together with the uh, joyful anticipation of uh, Christmas to come. Uh, The Advent season surrounds this idea of repentant joy, where on the one hand, we uh, we look inward at our our hearts, our lives, and our world, and see the reason why we needed to have a Savior come. But then uh, there's that joyful expectation on the other side of we know that God did send His Son, um, and we can rejoice and find uh, hope and peace and, and joy ultimately in Him. Uh, This week is the week that uh, goes along with the idea of uh, hope as we move forward together through the season, and we're going to be looking um, in our midweek services at the book of 1 Thessalonians, uh, which is, uh, Paul writes this letter uh, to the church, and ultimately he gives them a lot of compliments. They have a lot of reasons uh, to feel uh, feel good about what God is doing in their midst there, Uh, but but he gives them... um, kind of their marching orders, promising that Jesus is coming back, that there's an urgency to getting the gospel out. Um, and he gives them uh, kind of their, their steps along the way to get their hearts ready, their lives ready, their church and, and the world ready uh, for the next coming of Jesus. And so we're going to be looking at uh, different pieces of that each week. Um, and so uh, with that, uh, today is kind of uh, an overview, the introduction of First Thessalonians that we're going to look at together. And uh, we have before us a service template called Evening Prayer, a historic uh, service of uh, really the Christian church. Lots of different Christian traditions uh, utilize this. Um, and it's, it's all centered around the idea of uh, Jesus being the light of the world. And it's always used uh, after the sun goes down to remember that uh, even in the darkness, uh, we still live in his light. Um, and the service, as... Uh, as is its tradition, does not have an opening hymn. And so I invite you to stand as we open today's worship in the Lord's name and with his blessing. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness. And the Joyous light of glory. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, for you are merciful and you love your whole creation, and we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. The psalm for this Advent service is the 122nd Psalm read responsibly. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. 
I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure and love you. Let us pray. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend on us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth, and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever.
is from the, chap- the first chapter of St. Paul's first letter to the church in Thessalonica. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness, steadfastness of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning to us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now, now in these last days, days he has spoken to us by his, by his son. son. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the early days of professional football, No one knew how much time was left in the game, except one person, the referee. The official game clock was right here, and only right here, on the referee. Now you can imagine that this uh, led to some confusion, and uh, some debate, and uh, even a little violence once in a while, as teams that tried to follow the clock on the wrist of the referee uh, got it a little bit wrong. At a certain point, the NFL implemented a solution to this, that the referee would stop the game and announce when there were two minutes left. And so the two-minute warning was born. Now, this got pretty popular, and as uh, NFL football started being on TV, all the more so, because what teams would do is they developed what's called a two-minute drill. And inside that two-minute drill, There was a lot of action. Teams were a little bit more adventurous and bold in their play calling. Scores were were quickly run up from where they had remained for the rest of the game beforehand. It was the most exciting time and the most watched time of football. Now, um, the AFL, when they came onto the scene as a rival to the NFL, one of the ways that they tried to lure new franchises over to their side was to promise that in all of their stadiums, there would be a viewable stadium clock so everyone knew how much time was left in the game. Now, uh, when the AFL and the NFL finally merged, one of the terms of the merger was to keep public the game clock and to retain the two-minute warning that the NFL had. Now, the two-minute warning wasn't as necessary as it once had been, but because of increased viewership, because of more exciting football inside of that two-minute warning with those two-minute drills, the advertising revenue at the break of the two-minute warning could simply not be ignored. So no longer was it a strategic advantage, but from the corporate view of professional football, you couldn't get rid of it. That's where they made all their money, right there. Now, if we look at the different epistles that Paul wrote, this evening we have before us 1 Thessalonians, what we normally see is something like Paul settling disputes and encouraging Christian behavior. 1 Thessalonians is just a little bit different. It almost reads like Paul's two-minute drill for the Christian church. In every chapter of 1 Thessalonians, Paul repeats a theme at least once per chapter, that Jesus is coming back and soon. 
And so we are in the two-minute warning of world history, if you will. That Jesus has come and has promised to come again will be the end of time. And so, what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians is a series of plays, if you will, reminders to the Christian church, and in rapid-fire form, to get ready for that second coming of Jesus. And ultimately, to find comfort and confidence in what Jesus has done to get us ready for that time. Now, the first thing that uh, Paul presents as a uh, two-minute drill play, if you will, to the church at Thessalonica is stop worshiping idols. I think that's very obvious to all of us to say, but consider that Thessalonica was in the shadow of Mount Olympus. And so the Greek pantheon of gods permeated all of daily life. And so if you were involved in agriculture, your neighbors, your friends, the people you worked alongside, they expected you in the rhythm of your day to be doing things like prayer, rituals, sacrifices, worship to the uh, section of the pantheon of gods that dealt with agriculture. If you were uh, someone that dealt with uh, trade, worked in the marketplace, uh, people would expect your friends and neighbors that they would see you engaged in prayer and worship and rituals and sacrifices to gods of commerce. And in every avenue of daily life, no matter what Uh, what your career was, what your vocation was, there was just an expectation of everyone that you would see each other being active in the religious life of the Greek pantheon of gods. So enter in the Christian movement that changes things, that makes things really difficult, because as soon as someone converts to Christianity, it is painfully obvious all day long to everyone around them that they are something different now, that something has changed. They're not engaging in all of those idol-worshiping practices. And so there's a lot of persecution, great affliction, our text says. And so imagine the pressure that that would put on a person daily to not only stick out, but be actively persecuted and endure much affliction because of this choice that that you've made, this movement that you've become a part of, this new identity that you've found in what Jesus has done for you. So being a Christian became something that you had to endure and be fierce about. And so the temptation was always there to turn back to idle practices. The temptation was great. But I got to say, In terms of our perspective now, I think that the first letter to the Thessalonians is a really great letter to us too, especially at this time of year. Consider this. I read a while ago what was an interview that, I guess, a European newspaper did with someone who spent uh, a certain length of time in America early on in the 20th century. And they were here in particular uh, through the fall and winter. And they came back and were asked, well, what's, what's interesting about American culture and life? And they said, well, I think what we have is there's this American God. And the American God has a big beard and a red suit. And to, to mark the beginning of a large festival to honor the American God, families... Um, have these feasts where they sacrifice turkeys in honor of the coming of the red-suited, bearded American God. Isn't that a kind of an interesting account? Because I don't know how to feel about it. And maybe you're with me, because at first, you laugh. And then there's this feeling, like about right here, that goes, oh, wait. And I think it's true that when we consider what it means to worship an idol, being putting a priority on anything in life over God for any amount of time. The temptations are as great for us as they were for the Thessalonians. And so, really quickly, things like careers, advancement, achievement, our cars, our homes, our social life, even sports, even festivals and holidays, can very easily become idols. And Paul's first play in his two-minute drill is knock it off. Now, the next play that Paul sets before us on his two-minute drill 
is a need to witness, to share the gospel with everyone everywhere. People that are struggling with the same things that we are and desperately need a savior today, tomorrow, and forever. Now, I think it's, it's kind of fun that uh, if you look at uh, the book of Acts, there's an account from the leadership of Thessalonica, the pl- political leadership of Thessalonica, that said, uh, that had an account of the Christian movement in their town. And the quote from that leadership, it says that they were doing all kinds of difficult things all over the world. I really like that. Because what that says is, they could not conceive of the possibility that anywhere in the world there could exist a place where the Christian movement, the gospel message, had not absolutely permeated the culture. And that is from non-Christian political leadership in Thessalonica. We also see that uh, Paul encourages these people who have endured affliction with joy, it says. Imagine that, that they're going through this persecution. There are all kinds of temptations to go back and worship idols in their old manner of life, and they are finding joy in the afflictions that they are enduring. I think that's a, that's a good encouragement for us because we know how awkward it can be to talk to a non-Christian about our faith. We see someone going through a hard time. We know the thing that would get us through. We want to share it, and when we do, it doesn't always land well. Well, the, the Thessalonians are an example to us of not only seeing that awkwardness, feeling that awkwardness in the culture, but enduring extreme persecution and afflictions and finding ultimately joy in their faith because of it. Now, a lot of this, I think, is, is kind of difficult to understand. But don't worry, Paul wraps that up. The third play in Paul's two-minute drill is to always remember that Jesus is coming back. Now, I think there's a temptation when bad things happen to look around and think, surely Jesus can't be there, can't be real, can't possibly care. All these things are a temptation when things go wrong. But in fact, the opposite is promised. We've seen as the church year wound down over the last few weeks um, here in worship that the worst possible imaginable things are going to happen that the world is not going to end quietly, that there will be wars and rumors of wars and famines and split families and arguments of all kinds. Every bad possible thing will happen. The stars will fall from the sky. The moon and the sun will not glow anymore. Everything we depend on will let us down. And yet, in the end, Jesus remains. And so Paul is encouraging the people then and the people now who await the coming of Jesus, to never forget that he is coming. Now, I think there is a very important final play in Paul's two-minute drill in the book of 1 Thessalonians that helps us find hope in the midst of a lot of intimidating circumstances, particularly in those previous plays. And I think we find that right up front. Paul opens his letter to 1 Thessalonians by addressing it to uh, the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about that. The first detail we learn about these people is that they live in Thessalonica. They are the Thessalonians. The very next thing we learn about them is that they are in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be able to describe people as being in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that means that despite persecution and temptation, when we fall down yet again to a distraction that becomes an idol to us, when we're intimidating to share the word, when we're tempted to believe that things are too bad, that Jesus is out there, It means that our faith reminds us over and over again that we are people who are loved and we are people whose identity can be found in the whole idea that 
God loved us enough to send his son and equip us to get through anything in faith. And that that love endures all things and perseveres all things, and that love is the thing that's going to be left when everything else lets us down. That love of God gives our faith to us that reminds us that when we fall down, we're forgiven. And we're never abandoned, and we're by his side all along. And the love of God is the thing that as we march together through this Advent season, points us right to the manger. And God's ultimate act of service and love that prepares us for any circumstance, any time, any place. And so, what we find is that we really are equipped and ready for the journey ahead as the Savior comes. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which certainly surpasses understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ to life everlasting. Amen. Please stand. kneel or be seated for our prayer this evening, and please note that as we sing our prayer, we overlap with the last word of each line. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above, And for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. For Matthew and William, for all pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. For Joseph, for all public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. 
For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen.